Thank you all for, number one, taking time out of your quilting to come and listen. And from uh, our media standpoint, there's Sarah way, way back in the back corner. From everyone's walk of life, it's great to see that there is uh, an interest being shown in an announcement that I believe has some benefit for uh, our community. And certainly that's the reason that I continue to be involved in this, uh, in politics. I was speaking with a young lady this morning uh, who interviewed me down at my office, my old office, and we were chatting about where the city was and where the city is and where the city's going. And our visions were very much the same, <coughs> that we need to do what we can do on behalf of the community, and we do that with the budget in mind to make sure that what we are proposing is affordable and it's workable and it's beneficial to everybody. And that is in line with what uh, this announcement is about this morning. During the 2010 election campaign, I released a series of proposals having to do with city governance. That is the way that we organize the responsibilities and resources of city councillors so that they can best serve their constituents. In setting out those proposals, I can recall that the reference I used most frequently at the time was a very simple word, but a very meaningful world, word called communication. I have long been an advocate of the idea that the best way to avoid a closed mind is to keep an open channel of communication. And I ensure that I do that in my own day-to-day -day life, and I see that with other people who are very successful in getting things done. Over the past four years, we have made some very good and innovative progress in improving communication with those we serve. I include here providing counselors with updated cell phones, their own discretionary budgets, and dedicated staff at City Hall. A new social media policy for the city, my own pages on the city website, my own Twitter account, and three Twitter town halls. Add to that a series of my own reports on council's activities that were communicated to the public so that we could properly hold ourselves accountable for our work. I issued those reports on the anniversary of the first 40 days in office, the first six months, the first year, the halfway point of the term, and at the completion of three years. All of these actions were new to the city as they had not been done before. They represent my ongoing commitment to meaningful and transparent communication and accountability. I am pleased with this progress and I think that we have now set a course for all those who follow, who aspire to be part of this great city to have something to use as a bar as we progress. Today I want to advance this progress even further with a more advanced set of communications tools that build on our accomplishments and strengthen the role of counselors and communities and their communication with each other. This morning I'm pleased to make four proposals in that regard. First, I mentioned earlier that current city councilors were the first in our history to receive their own discretionary funds in the amount of $1,000 annually. Not a lot of money, but enough that they have made a difference when they chose to use it. They use that for the purpose of carrying out their responsibilities, dealing with their constituents. For the most part, these funds have been used to improvements in technology, training and conferences, neighborhood improvements, and public meetings for their constituents to speak their minds and to get, make sure their ideas are brought forward. I will recommend uh, to the new council of this fund be increased by an additional $500 per councillor for the exclusive purpose of councillors conducting public meetings in their wards. In this way, we will encourage greater communication on matters of local importance, improving relationships with constituents, as well as our transparency and accountability. Second, we are very fortunate to have Kojiko TV as a broadcaster of our city council meetings. I hear from many people that this broadcast is not only very popular, but a key source of information on the activities of City Council. It is time now to expand that communication through the live streaming of Council meetings, as well as meetings of our standing committees. I will be recommending that the City proceed immediately with the live streaming of these meetings, the effect of which will be to reach more people more frequently, and again, to improve our transparency and accountability. Third, I believe that we need to assist those communities with whom we interact. And here's what I mean by that. It is common that an individual will appear before a committee or at council 
representing his or her own interests. In most cases, that person knows that their case might be stronger or better informed if they had the support of others who share their viewpoint. Counselors too understand that a wider expression of local opinion is a better measure of community sentiment. In recent years, there has not been a strong history of the formation of organized resident or ratepayer groups speaking to council on local interests. I believe that communities strengthen themselves in a great variety of ways when they are organized to both respond to local proposals and to initiate local improvements. It is also plain that organized communities are safer communities. Accordingly, I will identify and make available staff resources to reach out, inform, and assist all neighborhoods in organizing local resident, ratepayer, tenant, or issue associations. I believe that in time it will be a real asset in improving our communications and accountability. And finally, I will be consulting with the new council on the best means to migrate from a paper world to a digital world. And here I am using paper notes today, but this will be one of the last times. <laughs> Peterborough City Council has not been quick to adapt. The warden and I attended a couple of outside council meetings, one of them at Curve Lake, where they all were using iPads and computers rather than paper product, and it's time that we brought ourselves up to a new standard. The use of electronic reports at council and committee meetings is where we will go with this, and I think it's very important and, and timely for us to make that move. At a minimum, I believe the councillors should now be equipped with the means to carry out most of their business electronically. This is one of a series of public proposals that I will be releasing in the days ahead, and I'm very pleased that you are here to start this process, and that you'll carry this message forward. So, thank you for being here this morning. We have coffee, and don't eat all those cookies on the right, because those are my favorites. So like <laughs> thank you for being here. Gladly, if there's any questions from anybody, I'd gladly try to uh, propose an answer. Does anyone want to talk about parkways or casinos or police matters or undertakers? <laughs> <laughs> Dean, come in. Don't be standing in the hallway. There's no visitation in here. <laughs> yeah, Daryl, uh, I've come across several times when, uh, during uh, canvassing there that a lot of people don't understand the option to uh, uh, the parkway, that if you go up Fairburn Street, uh, they don't realize that there are 27 houses going to be taken down. And what's the cost going to be for the city to buy that? And again, are these people going to uh, be quite happy just to sell their house, or are they going to go to court? And what would be the... Uh, the potential of, of that. That's and a great. A lot of people, uh, uh, several that I've talked to, they didn't realize that. that. That's a great comment, Fred. And thank you. First of all, thank you for canvassing, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. We we debated that as part of the process. We we put a planning tool in place to assist with the future development of the north end of the city of Peterborough. It's a two-lane arterial street that runs in the Parkway corridor, runs from the southwest to the northeast. It's there if it is required. If it's not required, it won't be built. Operationally speaking, $79 million as opposed to $93 million doing exactly what you just said. We can go from Clonsell in the Parkway up to <coughs> Medical Drive. Medical Drive then runs to Park Hill. We can come down across Park Hill. We can go north on Fairburn Street and then reconnect back up to the corridor. But to do that, we lose 20 some odd houses on Fairburn Street. They're very affordable houses. It's a very affordable community. They're gone. We widen Fairburn Street. We do some other work on other streets in the city of Peterborough to a tune of $93.3 million. And then just when the development occurs in the north end, that all fails and we have to go back to the drawing board and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So the proposal that's in front of us makes perfectly good sense from a planning standpoint. It makes perfectly good sense from a financial standpoint. And it works. That's what, we're, that's what it's all about, and all we've done is said to staff, there's the tool, as the proposals come forward, there's how you can go ahead and propose a bill. But the Eddie Parkway of people have been concentrating on no bridge, mm -hmm. but they don't tell you the option what it's going to cost for that. Yeah. And, and that's 
passion, emotion, and misinformation. Yeah. It was very evident through that process. And it's the interesting part of it is and what position you take on is your business, not mine, but my position is clear. The people who are showing major opposition to it are from Park Street on the south, sorry, on the east, Monaghan Road on the west, Charlotte Street on the south, Park Hill Road on the north. That's the group of people in that area who are showing most concern about the park. I had an environmentalist come up to me after the last debate and he said that he actually was invited on the tour by the No Parkway people. He walked the whole park with them. They showed him the trees that were going to be in danger. They showed him where the bridge was going to go and he said to me afterwards, build the parkway. It's the only logical thing to do because those trees are at their lifespan cycle now. <coughs> this is going to be the perfect opportunity for it and he said it's going to enhance the city. It's not going to be a detraction. So. Yeah, how many trees are coming down along uh, Fairburn too? Considerable. Yeah, it's a major, it's a major yeah. upheaval in that area. Yeah. And it, it was, there was lots of debate about it. There was lots of opportunity to bring forward fresh and new ideas. And what we had was exactly what the consultants had uh, ruminated over. They, they went through every possible scenario. And what they came up with was the logical plan for future use of that corridor as it relates to growth in the city. And that, that's, <coughs> we get it all the time. People want jobs. Great. You're not going to have a 10,000 man factory move back into the city of Peterborough. Those days are behind us. The new technology almost demands that you don't have that type of environment. What you do have, though, is the need to deal with people's needs. 25,000 <coughs> people in this community are seniors. Within three years, there'll be more people over 65 than there will be under 15, under 14, actually. We need to understand what their needs are. We need to add more people to that mix. And the way you do that is to build and endorse size within this community. 15 to 25,000 people is what we need to bring us up to almost a minimum standard as to what our growth factor is going to require going forward over the next 10 to 20 years, and that's what the plans that are in place now have done. Look around the city and see the changes that, you, that have occurred in the last four years. Modest by any standard, but <coughs> major by a point from this community standpoint, what was affordable. Lansdowne Street West being redeveloped, Park Hill Road being redeveloped, the new buildings downtown Peterborough, the removal of the old scrapyard on Bethune Street that seemed to miss everybody's attention, that took a major amount of tact and finesse to make sure that that was put through. All the old industrial sites now, virtually all of them, are being filled up, being repurposed, being reutilized. It's been quite a journey for the last four years, and I'll tell you, it does not happen easily. <laughs> <laughs> I Mr. agree Brown. with you. I think the reaction to many people about the parkway is passion and emotion. Yes. That's obvious. But that passion and emotion needs to be informed with reason. You call it lack of information. But you have to take a reasonable approach. <coughs> a gentleman said to me just this past weekend, he said, I'm not in favor of the parkway. And I said, oh. He said, no, it's going to destroy the park. I said, well, I don't think it will destroy the park, it may change it, but we didn't have time to go in further into the discussion. I think more information that's of a rational nature needs to be put out there. And I don't know how you plan to do that, but it needs to be done. As whether or not people who are so passionately engaged in this will listen to reason, I don't know. But I think it needs to be uh, done. Uh, get that information out there that it's not going to destroy the park. And that, that report is a public document. It is online. It's available to anyone who takes time to research it. It's a long report. It's a, it's a very uh, all-encompassing report because it forms a PA <coughs> study and it's a uh, big, big document. The bottom line is the actual high bridge that's going to the park will have perhaps four pillars that go down into the park. The new engineering technology affords us the opportunity to build the bridge over the park from up above, not down below. So there's going to be minimal disruption down below. The park's going to be closed for at least two years. No, the park won't be closed for two days. There'll be some equipment down on the floor of the park, building the pylons to support the bridge. That's all that will happen on the floor of the park. The other yeah, side of it is, and, and part of it, I'm sorry for stepping on you. Yeah. Part of it is we could have gone down through the park and back up. We could have gone across with a low bridge. We chose the high bridge to, to appease as many people as we possibly could. But in doing that, 
the cost of doing that went up considerably, but it's still well within our financial capabilities of dealing with it. And on top of that, it's an enhancement to the community. There's many communities that would just thrive on having that feature within their community. As I wonder, one, we have the lift locks, we have a number of other bridges, this one will be quite spectacular. People, people will get accustomed to it very quickly, I can assure you. It's yeah. beautiful. With well, my, my concern is, for instance, I've been following this. I didn't know some of the information you just gave me now. I'm not going to read a 376 report, page no, report, and, not, and neither are many people going to be reading that. But to condense that down, just as you did there, in a simplistic way, so that people can get that information and say, oh, that's what it's all about. That needs to, I think that needs to be done. And that information was brought forward at the debates when the parkway you know, was being considered, the EA process was being considered, and it was dismissed. It was dismissed. They didn't care. They, they didn't care about the 27 homes on Fairburn Street, those 27 families, those 27 extensions of our community. That didn't mean anything to them. They just didn't want their, their park interfered with. And it became very emotional and very passionate for a lot of people. And that's unfortunate because you have to use your head, not your heart. So it's tough decisions. There needs to be some reason. Yeah, for sure. Daryl, I've been in this city all my life. This young lady is going to be 90 <laughs> <laughs> this year. And this young lady held me the day I come home from the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Just two years ago. <laughs> um, we've been talking about the parkway as long as I can remember, at least 60 years ago, and it should have been built then. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realize that Jackson Park went up as far as Medical Drive. I thought Jackson Park stopped where the house is, or a little bit beyond, you know, the house that you go into. Jack Jackson Park <coughs> uh, actually continues down to uh, McDonald Street. And that's the second well, extension I mean, we that already runs right up to uh, Ackerson <coughs> Road on the north side. It's 4,000 meters long. Well, we do have a bridge over the park. Yes, we do. And that, that was built so that the people from the east could get across. I caught a little tone in your voice there. Did you grow up in the <laughs> east? <laughs> <laughs> You're darn <just> <laughs> <laughs> Beth, It's the best part of the city, as I far agree. as <laughs> Uh, uh, I found out that Jackson Park went right up to where Medical Drive is, over the hill. Yeah. And I really didn't know that. It was in behind that subdivision on the north side of Park Hill Road is what yeah. I'm referring to. But more importantly, <clears throat> the development that's being proposed that, that is triggering the need for the Parkway study is 2,800 2, homes in the Lily Lake subdivision area. That will give us two and a half times more land to add on to the existing park. That's part of the proposal <laughs> coming forward from the developer, and they're very pleased to give it up because it's hilly terrain, but it's just an extension of Jackson's Park. So it's going to double two and a half times the size of what's there now, free land to the park, free land to the users of the city of Peterborough, the people who want to make use of that. It's a fabulous addition, a fabulous addition. While well, you built the hospital, over in the west end. You built the uh, mall down in the south end. Nobody ever thinks of the east end. And it's a long way to the hospital from the east. And if they can get there faster, maybe they can save a few that have heart attacks. Because Good there's point. an awful lot of us getting older. <laughs> you know, we're not getting any younger. And I remind you now, you're living at Oxford, which is in the West End. Yeah. <laughs> I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn. Carol, your comments this morning are very revealing. I had not heard it put that way before, and to expound upon our friend uh, over here saying that that was important. Very much so. How in the world? Can you get that message, as you've given it to us today, without reading the big, oh, what's online and all the reports, mm -hmm. you've not had an opportunity other than today, and we're a small group. This, what you've said today, needs to go further. Where, where's the podium? Where can you get that across? Because I can see now that it's not in a debate because